that's they're really good about that, and uh, and that's terrific. Um, in the classes classrooms where we have a separate entrance and exit, we're using one door for, or we've got two entrance two doors. We're using one for entrance and one for exit. They're all marked. Students come in one way, they leave the other way. Every chair is spiked with tape on the floor, so those chairs stay exactly where they're supposed to be. Students have been instructed not to move those. I'm going to share a screen. You'll see what my classroom looks like. So hold on, folks. I'll I think I can get this to happen. So this is the beginning. They're not all there yet, but this is the beginning of a music theory classroom. Uh, they all gave me permission to take their photos. They're all wearing masks. They're all sitting six feet from each other. They're using music stands instead of desks, which get wiped down every night by operations. And any student who wants to has uh, access to the bottle of hydrogen peroxide solution and paper towel so they can wipe their own if they feel like they need to. I don't think any room that we're using has more than two classes in it a day. Many of them have just one. So there's not a lot of usage. And these rooms, the choral room and the instrumental room are um, uh, about 2000 square feet each with about a three to four story ceiling. So when you look at them, there's a lot of space and the air exchange is pretty good. Um, these are music theory classes, oral skills classes. And I think, Let's see, here's a choir rehearsal. This is their biggest class that we're offering this fall. It's got 24 students, although they're never all there. Um, but you can see where they are. You can see where the piano is. I'm always behind the piano. We're all masked. We're singing with masks. They're all singing straight ahead. The ceiling is pretty high and there's a, a, another ceiling above that false ceiling. So um, all the research shows that that's actually a really good thing uh, for aerosols. And you can see, it looks like they're touching their faces, but they're not, they're actually gesturing um, the hands that you see up doing things. Um, and they've been really cooperative and helpful and, uh, and making, things, making things work. Um, so we've got little tape on the floor that shows them where the legs of the chairs need to be. We've got smaller class caps than we usually have, so enrollments are lower. Um, music stands for desks. All the music for ensembles has been passed out electronically, so it's being scanned and sent. We've talked a little bit about how to use that. Some are using iPads, some are printing out their own, and some, Lord help their young eyes, are using their phones to read music. It doesn't work very well, but you know, every once in a while somebody ends up reading their music on their telephone. Um, we've got hydrogen peroxide in our each of our rooms in spray bottles to the right consistency, paper towels, we use that on piano keys. The, the uh, manufacturers say that's the best thing to use. We bought some Pro 5 uh, disinfectant, which is an industrial strength cleaner. And then app, because one, one person in the industry said that was a good idea, it turns out it's not good for the piano. So we never did end up using it. Um, our hybrid classes meet 50 to 80% of the time for the students. What that means is that there's more work online. So as Mia said, more on Blackboard, more homework. Um, homework for my classes is all being turned in electronically, graded electronically, put in the grade book electronically and sent back to them electronically. Um, I've gotten one test on a real piece of paper from them so far and uh, um, in, in any of my classes. Um, sometimes for our classes, the class is meeting 50 to 80% of the time and sometimes the class is meeting 100% but with staggered attendance. So my 24 voice choir met one day, eight for 25 minutes, eight more for 25 minutes, and eight more for 25 minutes. Uh, sometimes we, we break it up and have the men come at, at 11 and the women come at 20 to 12 and they get like a 10 minute overlap. So we're just doing whatever we can to lessen the number of minutes on campus and the size of the groups that are meeting together. Um, we are one of the things that we're doing, which I think is really helping us, is that you've all read some of the horror stories about music on the internet during the COVID-19 uh, episode. The choir in Seattle where so many people got sick and all those things. And we're aware of that. It's, um, and, and the horror stories, like everything else on the internet, are, are pretty extraordinary, but don't really apply so much to places like ours. We've got huge rooms. We've got uh, adult students. Um, we've got all good protocols from the college and equipment. Um, but we're reading what comes to us from the music organizations. And most of the major national music organizations have commissioned studies by medical schools at the schools where they work. So Colorado, Colorado State, Arizona State, University of Michigan. 
I'm, I am regularly reading five reports from different music organizations, national music organizations that are coming through about every two weeks or so as they change the protocols. Uh, got one yesterday from the state of Illinois, um, interim COVID-19 music guidance. You know, it's a three page report and it supersedes the one that came two weeks before and it's got Governor Pritzker's name on the top. And every time they change those protocols, we're rethinking a little bit about how we're doing things. And I think that's, we had no way to know last March what was exactly what was happening. We just went off campus and, and taught not very well, I might add, but we taught and students managed. But this fall, we're in a little better shape. We are having a student ensemble concert on the 14th of October. Each of the groups is taping its segment and then they'll all be uh, patched together and streamed so that our students will have the chance to perform. Um, for not for an audience, but it'll be for a streamed audience. And, and that's nice, gives us goals to work for. The challenges, uh, I like the way you put that on your, your PowerPoint, um, Mia, the, the challenges are legion. <laughs> um, the time management is, is so weird and so problematic. And every day you do something and go, well, I'm not doing that again. But in music, one of the issues is when I'm conducting, I'm often modeling things, vowel shapes, oh, ooh, ah, and I can't do that, and I can't see what they're doing anyway. So that's a real, that's a problem for us. We don't hear as well. The sound is muffled with the masks. We tried the same shields that you had in cosmetology, found they were completely unworkable for singers, and they started to pass out. They just couldn't get enough oxygen in for what they were putting out. So they have elected, they each one have one, but they've elected not to use those. The instrumental groups are strewn all around the room, like on the edges of the room, so they're 25 and 30 feet from each other. Um, but that's working. When they perform, um, they're moving toward having um, a mask over the end of a wind instrument, over a, the end of a flute or the end of a saxophone or a trumpet or trombone. They say nylon stockings work well. Uh, pantyhose work less well because there are two legs on each of those. But um, getting those on the end keeps some things from coming out. We're experimenting. The drummers bring their own drumsticks. The keyboardists wipe off the keys before they play. Um, we're getting there, and I think things are going pretty well. We learn a little bit something almost every day. Um, the, the not having visual contact really changes the way we communicate, and so for the singers, that's been a bigger issue than for the instrumentalists. The instrumentalists are okay. Um, we're making masks with zippers or flaps for some of the instrumentalists, for a saxophone or trumpet player. There are a lot of those out there. None of them seem to work well, but we've got a costumer in the costume shop here. So she said she would make uh, little trumpet masks where you've got a place for the trumpet mouthpiece and then everything else is closed off and trombone and saxophone. So we're working on that. I think in general, we're, we're pretty sanitary most of the time. We're not, we're not anything like cosmetology in that way, but we're pretty sanitary. But we do have a certain amount of body contact and, and we do have a certain amount of visual contact that we just can't do. On the other hand, and this is, I think, the biggest takeaway for me is that um, our music students know that you can't really learn music effectively online. So they are very grateful to our institution for making this possible. And in the choir, I don't, I haven't been around the instrumentalists as much, but in the choir, it's many days are very emotional. Um, they know that if they're sick or they're not feeling well or they've been around somebody, they have to just not come and they have to call it in. And we've been dealing with that. That's okay. But yesterday I had a young lady who was just not looking great during class, even with the mask on. I could tell she was just not having a happy day. And afterwards I asked, asked if I could talk to her and we stood six feet apart and there were no hugs. And, you know, it was all, it was all the right things for all the right reasons. And and I said, are you okay? And she just burst into tears. And I said, are, are you all right? And she said, I'm not all right anywhere except here. She said, when we're singing together, I have like an hour in which I can go back to realizing why it is that I'm here and why it is what I'm doing and so forth. And she said, and it gets near the end of that hour and I just get sad, sad, sad. And um, but I remind the students over and all what a privilege it is to be able to make music with them. I have to say for me, it's, it's a peak experience each day that we're together to make music. Not that teaching isn't, but making music has its own separate kind of thing that goes on. So that's where we are. We're, we're uh, making the best of it. I think our administrators in our area have been really supportive about giving us what we need and answering questions. And there's a staff in the MAC 
that that handles the touring things, but also our student performances. And a lot of them have been able to chip in and help with things that, that we wouldn't otherwise have. That's it for me. Lee, kudos, that was great. Um, and I, I would imagine that you guys will be advertising the, the student ensemble at some point. So, yep. okay, we can be on the lookout for that. Yep. Okay, awesome, thank you. All right, Jane, floor is yours, last but not least. It's interesting, we're all in the same division. Um, and uh, I know there's hybrid going on in health and science and business, but uh, but yeah, we're all together in ACH. Let me get my screen up. Because of course I've got pictures because that's the way we roll. That's the way I want it. Okay, there we go. Um, will that work? Maybe, maybe not. All right, so, um, you know, we, we're doing this because we feel this is critical content that we can't communicate any other way at, without the benefit of the interaction of our students. And this is the space we're using. Um, we had to completely rebuild our studio space. Um, we couldn't, for, for many of our classes, we couldn't effectively do half and half of the students. Um, we needed the time and then we'd end up doing more prep and you know it just was like a mess. So what we, um, we looked at a couple of different things. We looked at the idea of connecting rooms um, remotely with each other so that the faculty could maybe move between two studios uh, to have the students sufficiently distributed. And that was, was going to require a bunch of technology and cost and of course have, have challenges with it as well. And then one of our adjuncts who, um, who's actually here today, Karen Pearson had the brilliant idea of us using 1038 in the tech building, which is a very large room. And we were able to move 48 drafting tables into that room so that all of our studio classes are taught in that one space. And what you can't see is each of those desks have a couple of different colored pieces of electrical tape on them. And so one class, uh, the students sit at the yellow desk. My students sit at a desk with a red tape. And so that way we make sure that each desk is only used once a day and the students are well distributed through the classroom uh, during the day. Um, so one of the challenges, you know, the, the facial recognition is, I had a student walk in the other day and I was like, wait a second, who, who are you? Um, I was like, oh, you got a haircut. And he's like, no, I didn't because he wasn't who I thought he was. Um, when you only have half a face to work with, it's, it's a lot harder to recognize who you're talking to. Um, and you, of course, lose a lot of the communication. Um, laughing is, is helpful. Um, I tell them frequently I'm smiling under here um, and also try to reassure them that they're, they're doing well and getting the work done that they need to. Um, you know, communicating with half a face. Here you can see the distribution of the students in the room and get a sense of it um, and how spread out they are. The, the computer, the laptop on the front desk is because I had a student who uh, contacted me that a sibling had a fever and she wasn't sure if she should come to school or not. And so in discussing it with um, Jim Bente, we decided the best decision was to have her not come to school. So I set up a collaborate session so that she could be there remotely, um, which is what's, what's going on here. And then that was also recorded and available for a couple of other students that were, were absent. Um, so that, that's a challenge how to, um, how to accommodate those students as well as we can. The other thing that I find is 
you know, the students are so spread out. Um, you know, having the, the student feedback, having the conversations, getting the interaction. Um, I'm, I'm frequently telling the students they have to speak louder, they have to shout because I can't hear them from the back of the room. Um, and the mask, of course, makes it that much more difficult. And I'm sure they're, they have trouble hearing me. I know I feel like I'm just screaming the entire time um, and I'm pretty, pretty exhausted by the end of the class. Um, you know, here you can see again that kind of distribution of the students, but then by the end of the class, you can see the, uh, the divot in the side of my face from, the, uh, from wearing the mask for three and a half hours. Um, so I don't know, you know, that's our experience. Um, one of the things that I think we're really losing is the community uh, between the students. They're, they don't interact with each other. They're so spread out. There isn't the, um, the chatting and the conversation during class. Even when I try to, uh, to get that going, they're, they're just not as likely to, um, to, to talk. They just sit and work. So they get the work done but we're not, we're not building the community that we would like. And I haven't figured out a way to, um, to solve that problem. So I don't know, I guess that's about all I've really got on this. If I can find my way back to the screen. I can stop sharing, but I have too many. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Great, thanks. Thanks, I, there are two, two of the adjuncts that teach in that same room are here also. So we've got three, three people um, who use that space and their experience. Oh, I didn't meant to mention, so we've got a whole cleaning protocol. We've got wipes, we've got stuff to clean the keyboards and whatnot. And um, even though the desks are only used once a day to help the students kind of stay cognizant of what's going on, at the end of class, we have them wipe down their surfaces and anything they've touched just as a kind of reminder and, and to keep them aware of it. And one of the things that, um, that I never thought I'd be doing in college is they're asking to go to the bathroom, which is more just to um, manage the movement around the room um, than anything else so that we don't have people passing by each other or something like that. They're not moving very much. And that's about the only time they do. So I think that's about everything. Uh, Jane, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so my, my internet, of course, went out like five minutes ago. And so I'm struggling to get back in here. I'm on my phone now. So um, you know, these are the struggles that those of us teaching from home are dealing with, which is very different than some of which you just articulated. Jen, if it's okay, I'm gonna rely on you to field a lot of the, um, the questions in the chat, if that's okay, because it's hard, really hard for me to see them. But if it's yeah. okay, I'm gonna start with one. Um, I, it was really fascinating to me that, that Mia mentioned this first, and then Lee also talked about it, and so did you, Jane, that your, your students are, are laughing. And like that, this might seem like a silly question, but I was wondering if any of you can just sort of speak to the, the vibe that exists in your classroom. And I, I can only imagine that the first day your students came in that it just felt scary almost, but it seems like you've built some community even though there are challenges. So I wonder if you guys can just sort of, is it starting to feel more and more normal with each class period or how just how's that been like? What's the vibe been like? For me, uh, this is Mia. Um, for me, I find that the students kind of feed off of, they come in with their own vibe and then they feed off of yours. And so um, ensuring that even if it's something that I don't feel is working for me that day, I try to just keep um, keep everything in a, in a happy, positive mode. I'm realistic with them because if you're not, the students will uh, feel things are dis, you know, ingenuine. They, they do want you to be honest. So we're honest, I'm honest. But we, I come with a good, a good time because I enjoy seeing them, I enjoy teaching. I love teaching and I love working with them and we have a great rapport as it is. 
So when we come in together, we just focus on the fact that, that we are able to be together. We're able to work. We're able to learn. We're able to share. So that's kind of what's been helping me, I guess, in, in, in Cosme, that the students enjoy just being in each other's presence, especially compared to being completely online. I would say that um, in my academic classes in music theory and oral skills, it's pretty quiet. And the classes are small. I'm used to teaching 20 to 24 in those classes. And now I've got about 10 in each of them. And they're pretty quiet and they're not very social. And there are a lot of days when I feel like if I could just do cartwheels, I might be able to get them to lighten up a little bit. But like me, I'm trying to bring it each day and, and trying to get that to happen. In the choir I'm conducting, it's a little bit different because a lot of them know each other from last year and they have relationships together over the course of a year or more. And so, and they're also doing music together. And as a result, they, they form a little bit more of a community. Um, I know that some of them are going out and doing things, you know, they're, they're drinking coffee at Starbucks outside distanced or they're, they're uh, celebrating each other's birthdays or they're online FaceTime or, or whatever with each other a lot. So there's more community there. Um, I do think all of my students are, are pretty grateful for this opportunity to be at school and, and absences are actually much, much lower than they've, than they've ever been because every student goes, I get to go to school today. I better take advantage of that. And I say, I don't think I've had a big absentee problem before, but People are showing up and, and they're not showing up sick because we turn them away, but uh, they're showing up. So I think what is, what is missing is a lot of the, the social community that we try to build it is already hard at a community college, at a commuter school, but um, we're doing our best. And I think that's it. I, I ask my students every single class period if they feel safe. And I ask them how they're doing every class period. And I'm there before the class starts to try to chat them up a little bit and see what's going on. And I asked today if they were safe. And one of the girls came to me afterwards and said, you ask that every class period. I said, I know, I, I think it's important. And she said, I, I can't tell you, it just feels like normal that I come in here and I have my classes and I go away. I don't, I don't, it doesn't bother me at all. I'm not fearful, I'm not afraid of that. And I've thought about it for myself too. I'm probably in an at-risk population just due to age, if nothing else. And, um, I have to say, I'm a lot happier at College of DuPage than I am in the grocery store. Um, I got fewer crazies around me and, and people who know what the rules are and follow them. Nobody's going to get into a shouting match over whether masks are morally wrong or not. So, um, you know, those are just the rules. And, and um, I, I feel pretty safe. I've been tested twice because of another place that I do some work and uh, negative both times. And um, Everybody just wanted to make sure that the, everybody was negative. And I have to say that um, I don't feel any particular risk in being in the building at all. Um, and that's, and I'm there four mornings a week. So when I lost my internet, I lost track of all the questions that were posted in the chat. So I, I might run the risk of uh, implementing chaos here, but I'm going to unmute all of you. And if any of you have a question, I would ask that you um, either post it in the chat or uh, volunteer to just ask it with us. So we have 15 minutes remaining and I'm happy to cut this short or even go a little bit over depending on what sort of things you guys want to know. Um, so we do have a question from Laura Sieber. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I haven't had any student resist the rules at all. Um, they're like, and, and I told them the first day they're going to line up out in the hall. They're going to choreograph their movement in. We go from the furthest desk working our way forward. It took them a little while to kind of figure out exactly what was meant by that and, and learn it. And now they just do it. One of the things I've been doing is any, any handouts that I need to give them in terms of materials. I set it up at the, on a table right in the door and have them pick it up as they walk in so that I don't have to hand it out to them. Um, and they, yeah, they, they've been fine. Um, we, you know, no, no issues at all. Jane, um, can, can instructors wear a face shield rather than a mask when they lecture so it's easier? 
I don't I don't think it provides the same protection. I don't know. Um, my my understanding was you had the face mm -hmm. shield one with a mask, not instead of a mask. That's correct. And that was necessary, like if you had to be closer than six feet as a additional protection. Can students hear you? Are you muffled when you speak through the mask or can they hear you? I'm sure we're muffled to an extent, which is why I'm screaming so that they can hear me. Um, they seem to be able to understand me. I always have to ask them to speak more loudly, um, especially those that are in the back of the room. But, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's an issue, but not insurmountable. I would agree with Jane on that is that I'm used to speaking sometimes to choral groups that I conduct that are 100 or 200 people without a microphone. So I'm just outdoor voice all the time. That's what I do. And um, I, but I have a terrible time hearing my students. Um, and again, back row people, they're muttering an answer. And I say, I, I, you know, I know you just think it's because I'm old and hard of hearing, but I honestly can't hear you with your mask on. So there's a lot of that that we just have to do and have to process. And I say, you have to speak up. Singing, is, it's so weird to hear such muffled sound all the time, but we, we make it work. And um, um, I just, if I need to hear more, I just tell them it just needs to be louder. And that seems to work, but I've no resistance from anyone. We in the music business and the performing arts business are used to ordering people around. And <coughs> so whether you're a choral director or a stage director or a choreographer, you just tell people they have to go over there and that's what they do. And people who are in those fields are used to being ordered around. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but there are a lot of choir directors who became college administrators because they were used to ordering people around. And, and that's what we do. And any student who's in a choir or in a band knows the director says, do this, that's what you do. And I've not had a single student who's complained about the mask. I mean, they, they complain the same way I do is I'm all fogged up, I can't see anything. But nobody's, nobody tries to pull that mask down and cover just their chin, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And, and nobody, nobody has, has complained about any of the protocols they have to go through. They wait, if I'm passing back a test, they wait one at a time to have their name called, come up to the front. They give the person a wide berth. I, I'm really impressed with our students. So Laura Sieber asks a really good question in the chat. Um, it sounds like most of you have had students who've been compliant and have followed the rules. Have any of you had any circumstance where a student might have been asked, needed to, like, I, I know there has been speculation about like, are teachers now suddenly the mask police or like in, in what sort of circumstance have you had to been either get, been given guidance on how to sort of like monitor your students behavior or are there any situations in which you've actually had to do something? Um, I'll, I'll step in, I'm not, I'm not one of the official presenters, but um, I've had um, a couple of students, you know, from time to time where usually it's a matter of, you know, they, they moved a mask or took a mask off to, to drink something or eat something and, you know, habit of things for, forgot to put it back on and you, you know, you, you make the motion or you set at your, your mask and you know, they're apologetic and then, you know, realize that, you know, they know it needs to be on. Um, but I think the, you know, in our classes, at least, that, that I'm teaching, it, it's been made very clear that, you know, the option is this, or you wait until the whole mess is over before you can, you can take your classes and get your online, or, you know, and get your, your hands-on stuff in. So, you know, th they realize that that's the option they have. So, you know, they don't want it, you know, they don't have to be there. I actually yeah, appreciate it. For those of you that don't know, that's Tom Robertson. He teaches in auto tech. I'm actually really glad that you popped in here because I know you're dealing with this sort of stuff too. So if there are other yeah. questions for Tom, you're an official, you're our official fourth member of the, of the panel now. So, and I see Mia is on the go. Uh, does anyone else have um, questions that they'd like to ask? Or Mia, were you going to step in and say something? Well, I was just going to add that it's, it's pretty similar um, with mm -hmm. all the questions, you know, with the mask and the only, the only thing that the students, I haven't had students complain about anything other than the glasses fogging up. That's, that's one of the hardest things because I wear my glasses when I'm working and even with wearing the glasses, we still have to wear the face shield. So, you know, outside of that, you know, it's, it's just become sadly the norm. I mean, 
safely, but sadly, that is our new reality for a while. And the students have accepted that's what it is. Um, and just like Lee and Jane, everybody's just grateful to be on campus and to learn. Um, teaching them online, it, they did well, they did as best as possible in that situation, but they do realize the benefit of being in class. And with the face shields, because we are Cosme and we are uh, an industry that requires a touch, um, we do wear the face shield. I have um, a questions about group work and small groups and so forth. And that is, it's, it's a problem. It's very, it's hard to do. Normally I would have singers singing in a circle a lot. We don't do that. Um, or gathering in sections to do things. We're not doing that. Um, so it does modify the way that we do things. If students, if my students had to do academic work as group work, I'd have them do it online. Um, it's just too, it, it, it asks too much of people to work together but stand six feet apart. Um, and, e and even facing each other six feet apart is a bit of a problem. The issue is that really people should be faced the same direction. So um, I see those questions about, about the group work and it just means we, we lose a little something out of the way we might normally work, at least in my field. We, um, one of the projects that we normally do has the students build a composition together um, as, as a group. And that was something that we, uh, we did just yesterday. So normally I would divide the class into groups of uh, around four and they would, you know, discuss how to, how to arrange these various objects. Um, and then work on drawing them. Since we couldn't do that, um, you know, it requires touching things and, and being in too close a proximity. And I, I feel like the students do a really good job of the spacing and everything that we're asking of them when they're fairly static. But if we start bringing in a lot of, of variations, they're, they're going to lose track of it. Um, so what we did in this case, instead of breaking the class into smaller groups, we, we all worked together on one uh, composition. And I was the hands. They were the puppet masters, and I was the puppet. And I had a, um, we have a drafting table up in the front of the room for the faculty. We used that. I had the uh, the doc camera and used that and then kept moving it around to show them the view from different places and discussed what worked, what didn't work, what should we should try instead and, and got it done. Um, and, you know, so it was different, you know, but it accomplished the goals that we needed to do. And there was, um, there was the collaboration that we were looking for. And um, so in, in automotive, we we actually have, um, because of some of our, our class sizes and, and lab stations, we do have um, groups of two students working together, but because they're working together, they have to have their mask on and a face shield in addition, so that they're, they've got that extra um, layer of protection. Um, so the, you know, the program ended up buying all of the students face shields to wear. And you know, it's just you know, like the masks, it's just, it's become the new normal and you know, everybody wa you know, walks around wearing, wearing face masks and, and shields when they're working you know, with another student. So, you know, for a lab, for instance, they might both be sitting in the same car, one in the driver's seat, one in the passenger seat, or they're both trying to work on something under the hood or, you know, hook something up or, or whatever the case is. Um, you know, they know that they have to have that extra you know, that extra layer of, of protection, that extra, that extra piece of equipment on. And, you know, again, it's, uh, you know, they, okay, that's what we've got to do. But, you know, kind of like Jim mentioned, there's, there's a number of cases where for lab work, it's not practical for them to not do it with somebody. Um, you know, they, they need another set of hands to, you know, somebody has to crank the engine over or turn the key on while somebody else is, is operating a piece of test equipment. So there, there's times where they have to work together. So, you know, we had to have the provisions for that and that's you know, where the face shields come in. But, you know, it's also, you know, they still know that, you know, 
when possible, they, they should, you know, they, they keep that six foot buffer, then they don't, you know, they're not exposing themselves. Uh, any other questions out there? So it sounds I'm hearing some group silence, which I'm sort of assuming means we're reaching the end of this uh, panel. What I would uh, suggest, if you guys have questions, you can either email me or any of the panelists. If you look at the top of the chat box, I posted a, a little document which just provides some more details on all of our panelists, where they went to school, what their experience has been. Um, but I just want to say it's been such a weird year and I, I really, I got to commend our panelists, including Tom and any of the rest of you who are teaching in the class for trying to provide some sort of like normalcy and sanity for our wonderful students. So um, thanks to each of you for uh, serving on this panel. I appreciate all of you who came to this and listened. And um, uh, I will certainly uh, be loud and vocal about our next panel coming up in October. But for now, this meant a lot to me today. It was really fascinating to hear all of you speak to this. Um, and I, and I think the rest of us appreciated this. So thank you all. <laughs> good job. All right, be good. Drive safe, Mia, okay? <laughs> all right, you all have a great day. Bye guys, thanks everyone, take care. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm. Jane, that was great. Thank you. You're welcome. It was what it was. Yeah. Steve, how you doing? Good. How are you? Is Good. this your uh, is this your link? You're still yeah. recording, by the way. Ah, thank you. Um, I've never recorded before. Bottom of your screen when you hover, it's to the right of where you share screen. Yeah, I'm just seeing it says, do you want to stop?